All right, everybody, welcome. We'll go ahead and get started. You guys just keep right on eating. That's part of the whole process. Feel free to just keep right on going. And I'll also let you know, we like to keep these things really informal. So if you have questions along the way, uh, just fire away. And uh, if we don't know the answer, we'll make something up. Okay? <laughs> let me know if there's a problem. But um, for those of you who were here last week to hear Dr. Vince, uh, he started off this series with a, with a talk called It's as Simple as That. And he went way back to the beginning and talked about some of the very early stuff that we wanted people to understand. And what I want to do for those of you who weren't here is just give a little recap of that, okay? So we're going to go over just a little bit of what he talked about last time and then bring you into the main topic of our focus tonight, which is things haven't changed, or have they? Um, I want to tell you first, before we start, the reason I picked, that I chose this topic is a patient of mine um, had an unfortunate thing happen in their family. Uh, her father passed away, and they were going through his things, and it was really cool that they came across old brochures from his chiropractor from the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And that's what really got this started. So I took him to the office. She brought him to the office here, and I started looking through them, and I realized that the brochures that we're putting out that are on our front desk they're almost exactly the same as these. Now the, the screen printing is better and the graphics are better and they're prettier and they're neater looking, but the information that's inside of these things hasn't really changed that much in the last 50 or 60 years. And I got to thinking about that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We'll find out. So, let's get into this just a little bit. By the way, uh, I'm Dr. Ross Gibor. I should introduce myself first. Um, I've been here at Hassel Family Chiropractic for about two and a half, almost three years. I've been practicing for about 10 years. And so um, that's kind of who I am. And uh, I'm really proud to be a part of this team because we're really focused on health and using Gonstead Chiropractic and specific chiropractic to make changes. And I think you'll see some of that reflected in what we talk about tonight. So let's move forward here. So let's review. Just recapping a little bit of what Dr. Vince talked about last week. He started his series by giving a talk entitled, It's as Simple as That. And in order to understand where we're going, we have to understand how we got there. So, let's go back to the way beginning, okay? Literally. This is how we all start off, right? Each of us starts off, the sperm and the egg come together, this wonderful thing happens called life, right? And we take these cells, put them together, and they become one cell. Two separate cells become one, and then it starts to divide and divide and divide and divide and divide. And Dr. Vince went into that in a little bit more detail. But all we have to understand is that this process happens. These two cells come together, create this one cell, and that's the beginning of what eventually becomes us. And it's a magnificent thing. And it's magical and it's wonderful. And what happens along the way, once we get things going, the first thing that starts to develop, Dr. Dr. Hassel started to talk about, is the nervous system. Okay? We see this notochord start to form inside this process, inside these cells, and as things start to divide, this nervous system starts to develop first because it then guides the process the rest of the way. So it's really key to understanding how your nervous system works, how your brain and your spine function and how things work together. That began way back a long time ago, long before we looked anything like this, when we were just this little golf ball of cells all convoluted and brought together, already this nervous system was starting to function. And we all started out as this little ball of nerve cells. And I know sometimes at work we feel like a little ball of nerve cells, right? Like you're all wound up and tightened up. Maybe that goes back to that, I'm not sure. But this is the deal. We start out with this nervous system and it starts to divide up. And what we end up with is 31 pairs of spinal nerve roots. So as our spine starts to develop, we have all these little nerve roots coming off of the spinal cord in between the levels of vertebrae, okay? These 31 pairs of spinal nerve roots are a very complex web of neurons that come from the brain and the spinal cord. All thought, action, and control of our bodily functions originate right here, okay? Some actions are even so rudimentary and so basic that they don't even need to go all the way up the brain. They just come into the spinal cord, it sends a response right back. So that's how highly integrated this thing is. So the brain controls all this cerebral function, but the spinal cord is, is an extension of it. That's the central nervous system, okay? A hundred trillion cells all function in harmony and in constant communication with each other all day, every day. One hundred trillion cells, can you imagine? That's what you're made up of, a hundred trillion cells. And in order for you to do the most basic thing like chew food or take your next breath, everything has to communicate. The muscles in your diaphragm, 
uh, the oxygen sensors and the carbon dioxide sensors in your blood have to be sending signals to your brain, not to mention the fact that you're walking and chewing gum at the same time, right? All this stuff has to happen in a very, very coordinated, complex sequence. And if it doesn't, things get ugly in a hurry, okay? So here's kind of the basic breakdown of the nervous system. There will be a quiz at the end, so memorize quickly, right? Everything that we do is based on the nervous system. And whether you came in because you had low back pain or asthma or whatever, it doesn't matter whether it's visceral or biomechanical or musculoskeletal or whatever, that nervous system is in direct control of everything that happens in your body. And it all has to be communicated through your nervous system. So, pop quiz. In order to get to the next part... <coughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit, before we get to the next part, we have to understand some terminology. And there's, there's a couple of words that I want to kind of clarify with you. First off, let's talk about the scenario of this guy, okay? And it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman, I just put it that way. But let's talk about a guy. And I want to talk about the difference between being healthy and being well. And let's say you went out for dinner, and let's say you went to a place that's a little shady, and you got some food that was a little dodgy, and it clearly did not come from Jason's Deli, okay? Because that's good stuff. Right? Nobody gets sick after they eat this. But let's say we go to this place, and you eat some food, and it's, it's not quite right. It tastes okay, so you eat it. But you get home, and a half hour later, you're rumbling and bubbling, and things are kind of a little iffy. And before the time you go to bed, things are starting to spin, and it's not long, and you're down in the, the bathroom, and you're getting rid of it, right? How many people think that person's sick? That's sick, right? When you're puking your guts out, you're, you're lurching and, and everything's coming out, that's sick, right? We call them sick the next day. We're sick, right? Wrong. Why are we puking? Because your body's working right. You're right. That's the healthiest expression that you can have at that moment right then because what happened is you ate something that your body deemed dangerous to you. And your body is so innately intelligent, it picked up on the fact that there was something in there that you can't handle. So your body and its infinite wisdom and its innate intelligence said, I can do one of two things. I can either process this through my system and try to clean it with my liver, my kidney, my gut. I can try to kill it with stomach acid. I can do all these things. I can send white blood cells down to attack it. I can do all these things to try to kill it. Or I can just kick it out of here. Now, that's a healthy response. We feel terrible. Your body temperature comes up. You feel a little achy and you feel nauseous and you turn green and, and you get sick. And nobody likes that. It's not comfortable. But it's an extremely healthy response. What does medicine say? You're puking. You better take something to stop that. That's a sick response. We don't want to do that. So we're going to suppress it. Let's take a whole bunch of stuff to coat the stomach to fool the body to make sure that it thinks it's okay. Now, luckily, our bodies are so smart, we still have option B. Processing it, killing it, attacking it, and most of us come through it okay. But why not just get rid of it in the first place like your body wanted it to do? Same thing with a fever. When you get a fever, is a fever a bad thing? When you have a fever, are you sick? No, your body's very, very healthy when you have a fever. When kids get a fever, let them burn, let them cook, get up to that high temperature. That's what kills that organism. We need that fever. If you suppress that fever, you stay sick. So heat kills bacteria. Bacteria lives within a very narrow range of temperature. And your body is so smart, it says 98.6, 98.6, 98.6. I have an infection, 99.1, 99.5, 101, 102. Got it, killed it, break that fever, come right back down. Bacteria is dead, it died, we pass it through our system, and we get to be well again. If you suppress that, you continually be sick and your body doesn't ever learn how to process that stuff. So when kids get fever, we let them cook. It's good for them. How about this? How about a woman that's 42 years old and she's going to the gym and she's in terrific condition. She's four and a half percent body fat. She's a marathoner. She has two kids and she's on top of the world. But she goes in for an eval and she sees her doctor and they find a little lump inside her chest. Is that sick or is that healthy? We all know what that lump is, right? Cancer inside that breast tissue. Is that healthy or is it sick? Now you're all confused, right? <laughs> it's sick, right? By the time your body has processed and, and allowed that, that cancer to grow into what is now a lump, your body's failing. It's not doing what it should be doing. But let me ask you this. She didn't have any pain. She just went in for a regular checkup. And they found this thing. At what point did she get sick? Did she get sick the day they ran the, uh, the x-ray and the mammogram and found it? Was that the day she got sick? 
or did it happen months and months or years and years and years ago? And Dr. Vince talked about this last time. The food that you're putting in your mouth today becomes your cells and your structure tomorrow and the next day. So every day we're sloughing off cells and parts of our body are dying and they're being replicated, regenerated, and put back together again. Every single day, a hundred trillion cells dying and regenerating. And every couple of years, you get a whole brand new you. So remember that when you eat your food today, did you pick something good that's going to build a good heart and strong lungs and a good kidney tomorrow? Or did we put in Doritos that's going to make us pretty sick tomorrow? So it makes a difference. But pretty this, yummy tonight. Yummy? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes, yes. Great. Uh, but Sorry. this woman, no, you're good, Brad. This woman was sick a long time ago. When did it happen? And I'll say to you, the day she got sick was the day that her nervous system failed to understand that that cell was replicated inappropriately. And that's what cancer is. It's a cell that replicates inappropriately, and then it replicates and replicates and replicates, and it grows, and it's different than our normal tissue. And it starts to take up space, or it starts to cling on to our neurons, and it starts to kill our body. That's the day she got sick. And why did that happen? Because her nervous system was not in 100% complete control of what was happening. Because if it is, it kills cancer every day. How many of you have cancer right now? Raise your hand. Everybody have cancer? Every one of you should have your hands up. Because really? every one of you have cancer right now. I guarantee that there are cells in your body that are not replicating exactly right. But your body recognizes them, just like bacteria. And it goes in and it engulfs them. It eats them up. It destroys them. It says, hey, you don't belong. Get out. And it kills them right now. And if your body's functioning well and you're feeding it well and your nervous system is well, it goes in and it kills it right now and it stops the spread of that cancer cell. So every time your cells replicate, sometimes it makes a little flaw or it's not quite right, your body will go in and kill it and get rid of it. Remember that, it's only cancer when it's allowed to progress, okay? Okay, so we understand a little bit more about health and wellness and, and what is sick and what is not. So let's talk about healthcare, right? Medicine and chiropractic can both trace our roots of our understanding Back to our philosophy of Hippocrates, the Greek physician, 400 BC, we've all heard of him, right, in the Hippocratic Oath and all these different things. Other great minds contributed to the formation of current uh, thought, adding to the fields of physics, anatomy, biology, cellular anatomy. So there's some really great minds along the way that kind of were processing thought and understanding and were learning more about how the body works and all these things. So if we began the same, where did we hit the fork in the road? Okay, at what point did chiropractic and medicine come apart? And why did we go different routes? Why, if you're puking, why would a medical doctor say you're sick? And why would a chiropractor say, congratulations, that's wonderful, I'm so happy you're puking? <laughs> are we mean? Are we just, the, are we that guy? Why are we so different in our thoughts and in our beliefs? <coughs> it all started for medicine. We can trace it back to 1860. Robert Koch. Uh, hypothesized this germ theory of disease, and he postulated it in 1860, okay? It's not really that long ago. We're not talking about thousands of years ago back in Chinese times in medicine, and it doesn't all come from then, 1860. And now that germ theory is the basis of Western medicine's approach to health and disease, okay? So since this time, medicine has pretty much put its, all of its eggs in the germ theory basket, stating that microbes are the cause of disease. How many of you think that's right? If you have a germ, you're going to get sick. That's what medicine says. You can't avoid it, right? If you have germs, you better Lysol it and you better smear stuff all over your skin and you better take antibiotics because that's all that can happen is if you came across a germ, if I sneeze on you and I'm sick, you're going to get sick, right? But how come I can sneeze on Brad and he might get sick, but I might sneeze on Mr. Fever and he doesn't get sick? Why, why is that happening? So is, the, is it really the germ that caused the disease? Is it, the, is it the seed or is it the host? It's the host. So medicine still pays a little lip service to what they call preventative health care, right? But little effort is given to nutrition, rest, clean air, water exercise, posture, stress, and especially the integrity of the nervous system. These are important things. How many of you have heard, preventive medicine is kind of a big catchphrase. It's kind of like going green. Everybody's doing it, right? Everybody's going green and everybody's into prevention, right? So let me ask you this, a mammogram, is that preventive medicine? No, it's early detection, right? By the time they detect it on a mammogram, you're already sick, you already got cancer, we decided that, and that started way a long time ago. So that's not really prevention. How about any other screenings or devices that they do? They're basically looking to see how far along the disease process you already are. 
Now that doesn't mean that some of those things aren't okay to do and that there can't be some value in some of that stuff. But if we're going to truly be preventive, we have to go further back than that. And we have to talk about the integrity of the nervous system. So in this system of medicine and the germ theory of disease, the patient becomes a passive recipient of health. The doctor becomes active. In other words, you get sick and present yourself to the doctor who has the education and expertise to help get you well. You only get well because they make you well, right? That's the thought. They can give you the medicine, they can give you the surgery, they can give you the diagnosis that will help you get well. But up until that point, you're just this helpless carrier of disease that's come to them and presented yourself and said, I need your help. We disagree. That's not the end of the slideshow. That's not good. Okay, well, we'll figure this out. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about how this nervous system works. Sorry about that. The slideshow looks like it's going to be off, but I've got it here. So, talk about the integration of the, of the nervous system. Okay? We talked about this nervous system and how these nerves come out of the spinal cord and out in between each bone, and it controls all these hundreds of trillions of cells. Think about the activity that's going on inside your body right now. You're now digesting food, you're drinking water, you're exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide, but your brain is involved too, right? You're thinking, cognitively processing things. You're holding yourself upright in your posture, you haven't slumped over in your chair. You're aware of that there's pressure on your backside and on your feet, but your body's kind of pushing that aside because it's not important. But you're fighting infection, you're, you're, you're secreting insulin to help you digest this food and help put the sugar away. You're doing all these things all at, all at once. So think of it like this, what if I juggle, right? Okay, now stick with me because I'm a better chiropractor than a juggler, okay? But watch what happens, okay? As I go through this process and I juggle, think about the processes that are happening in my body right now. Mm -hmm. I have to stand upright, I have to watch, fluid in my ears is balancing me. All these things are happening in my body. My muscles are firing, Golgi tendon apparatuses, but clearly I can't watch each of these things as they're happening, right? It all has to be this process that's going on inside my body. Now watch what happens. <coughs> I'm going to start to juggle and I'm going to remove one of my senses from the equation, okay? Be careful. Sorry. Watch. <laughs> okay, so we're going pretty good. Now watch what happens. <laughs> if I can't see what's happening, I lose part of that sensory process that's happening. So clearly that was a big part of what was going on inside of me, right? What about in your body? What if the nerve is shut off to your gut that's digesting food and that food has bacteria in it? Does it then now go through your body and make your liver and your kidneys and all those things work harder? And what if it's the part that's replicating cells in your breast tissue right now? Is that important? Every single part has to work every single time. And that's what we focus on. Making sure that you have full integration. So, let's move forward. Sure. Sorry, my slideshow didn't work here, but I want to talk about a little bit more this evolution of, of medicine and their thought, because I think in order to understand us and what, how we think, we have to understand how medicine thinks. And again, don't get me wrong, this is not beating up medicine, right, okay? I've had surgery in the past and it saved my life. I had, if you see my scar, I've had my head taken apart by a very skilled neurosurgeon who literally saved my life, and I'm grateful every day for him. If I step out on the street today and I get hit by a bus, I'll need an adjustment, but first let's make sure we stop bleeding, okay? And those guys are really, really good at that, and I thank them every day. But we're not talking about acute trauma and that kind of stuff. We're talking about health and wellness, and that's a different gamut altogether, okay? So, as a matter of fact, when this whole germ theory of disease thing came about in 1959, so we're talking 1860 germ theory of disease comes about, 1959, about 100 years later, Dr. René Dubois said, all important infection will eventually be controlled by the use of therapeutic serums and vaccines specific for each and every type of microbe. So his thought was, we're going to isolate every bad thing out there, we're going to develop a vaccine or a treatment for it, and we're going to kill them all. We're going to get them all. And everybody will be perfectly healthy because of that. Did that happen? That's all right. No, what happened instead is where we are now is antibiotic resistant microbes are now a very, very serious concern. Okay? So what we did is we taught germs how to live inside of this 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 process. So you've got now we've got super bugs and they're pretty amazing. And they they can live outside of all these medications. As a matter of fact, microbiologists will now tell you there are microbes out there that can live on antibiotics. They can feed on it. 
okay? It's food to them. They've gotten so used to it, and they're evolving so rapidly, because that's biology. That's what the world does. That's what we do. It's what all these things do. They evolve, they learn, they move on. Viruses mutate. That's why flu vaccine doesn't work. Never has, never will, because by the time they figure out what there was last year, guess what? It's mutated eight times, and by the time it comes time again, but we're not getting sick because of those viruses, are we? Those viruses don't make us sick. If they did, everybody would get sick every time. Because if you really believe that wiping the handle at the high V counter uh, on your shopping cart is going to keep you from getting sick, guess what? As soon as you step into that high V and there's a thousand people inside there, like there was Super Bowl Sunday, I guarantee you're breathing every bit that they were all breathing. And if there's a sick person in that room, you got whatever they had. Did you beat it or did it get you? It depends on how healthy you were. Were you well fed? Were you well hydrated? Were you well rested? And was your nervous system acutely aware of what was happening so it could beat that virus? You're gonna get you're gonna get exposed. It's gonna happen. You can't not get exposed. So, taking a look at the evolution of modern medicine, I really hoped that my slideshow would, would come up because there's yeah, some pictures of some of these things. <laughs> it's a bummer, isn't it, Brad? <laughs> Let That's me talk to you about <laughs> Let me talk to you about what's going on. If we go back just 150, 200 years to where medicine was, there was some really wild stuff going on. And I just want to bring this to your attention. For instance, from 1700 to 1810, there was a thing called the tobacco smoke enema. Anybody ever heard of it? <laughs> this is crazy. But here's what it said. The treat this treatment, called tobacco smoke enema, was considered by humane societies to be as important as important as artificial respiration. Meaning, if you stop breathing, the doctor's first action was to shove a tube up your rectum and begin pumping tobacco smoke into your body. In other words, what we now do as CPR, breathing air into the lungs, they breathe tobacco smoke up the rectum and they thought that would bring a person back. 1700 to 1810. That's a long time ago. That's a lot of tobacco smoke. Okay, so let's move forward. Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup, 1849 to 1930. This product was advertised as likely to soothe any human or animal, and it was specifically targeted at quieting restless infants and small children. I have a new baby. She's seven weeks old, and sometimes she cries. And I can understand where if you had a baby that cried all the time, you would probably want to do something to soothe that child, right? Mm -hmm. So from 1849 to 1930, Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup did this. The formula's ingredients consisted of a large amount of morphine sulfate, oh powdered opium, sodium carbonate, and aqua ammonia. Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup was replaced when scientists at Bayer, okay, you know Bayer Pharmaceutical? They're still around, right? They started doing some research and they started marketing a product with the chemical name diacetylmorphine. Has anybody ever heard of diacetylmorphine? It has another name that I'll bet you've heard of. More commonly, what's that? Acetaminophen? More commonly marketed, legally at the time, with the market name heroin. Oh, wow. Oh so, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, heroin. It went on to cause countless thousands to become highly addicted and hundreds of thousands of deaths, right? They're all a bunch of heroin addicts because they didn't want them to cry. The effects of heroin were widely known immediately. So as soon as they started pumping heroin into these kids, they realized this is going to be a problem. But the company continued to market the product for 10 more years. Just like today. How many times don't products get recalled? You know why they get recalled? They only get recalled when the cost of defending it in court becomes more expensive than what they were making on the revenue side. That's when products get, re get recalled. That's what Bayer did back then. It's what they're still doing today. Okay? So they'll know it's going to kill you. They're, they'll know it's going to get you addicted. They'll know it's going to cause you damage. But they're not going to recall it until the balance says... It's out of balance, we can't make money on this anymore. It's time to pull it off the shelves. Next one. <laughs> this one I think is great. Lobotomy. 1900, get this, to 1979. Lobotomy. This is my lifetime. This is your lifetime. We were all alive in 1979, right? Maybe with the exception of a couple of them back there. <laughs> 1979, this kind of hit home with me. Lobotomy. The lobotomy consisted of cutting the connections to and from the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain, the anterior part of the frontal lobes of the brain. The procedure involved drilling holes into the patient's head and destroying tissues surrounding the frontal lobe. And the picture I have is these two huge metal rods going right in underneath the eyes. Um, 
Dr. Moniz, who's the most famous guy who did lobotomies, the surgeon, conducted scientific trials and reported significant behavioral changes in patients suffering from depression, schizophrenia, panic disorders, and mania, or manic depression. Sure, of course they exhibited different, different results, right? This may have something to do with the fact that the patient was now suffering from a mental illness and brain damage. That's what they finally came up with. Okay, so it didn't cure the mental illness, it's just that they added brain damage on top of it, and if they did enough brain damage, the patient stopped exhibiting the symptoms that they were having before. <coughs> Despite general recognition of the frequent and serious side effects, the lobotomy expanded and became a mainstream procedure all over the world. In 1949, this Dr. Moniz was actually awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. The Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1949 went to a guy who was jamming steel rods in the front of your brain and causing brain damage. Isn't that great? During the 1940s and 50s, 1940s and 50s, that's not that long ago, most lobotomy procedures were performed in the United States where approximately 40,000 people were lobotomized. We're not talking about 25 people. 40,000 people during that 10 year time frame were lobotomized. Now, I'll offer it up to you. I think half of them are still driving around on I-235 <laughs> in the left lane with their turn signal on, right? And they're still out there. They're just, they're menacing drivers now. So they're still out there running around with no frontal cortex. <laughs> Last one. This one I kind of laughed about. And since there's no children, we'll talk about it. It's called female hysteria from the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. And this picture is really funny. There's a, a Victorian woman sitting on a table, and the doctor's down on his knees reaching up under her dress. And it says, it's a disease of the mid-quarters from the neck to the knee. <laughs> this just cracks me up. The diagnosis and treatment of female hysteria was routine for hundreds of years in Western Europe and America. Women considered to be suffering from hysteria exhibited a wide array of symptoms including faintness, insomnia, fluid retention, heaviness in the abdomen, muscle spasms, shortness of breath, irritability, loss of appetite for food or sex, and a tendency to cause trouble. <laughs> I just think that's really funny. So the treatment, what they came up with was this vibrating device that the doctor used to help relieve the woman's stress, and you can all use your imagination. But that ended, that treatment, those devices at that time were only available to the doctor. So only the doctor had access to this thing. But with the advent of modern electricity that became available in the homes, all of a sudden it wasn't a sought after medical treatment anymore and the uh, diagnosis of hysteria was done. They decided that women weren't hysterical anymore. <laughs> so there you go, modern medicine, a little tour. Okay, so is it really all that ridiculous? Are these things, they're preposterous, right? I mean, who's going to let somebody drill into your head and cause brain damage so that you're not depressed, right? Who's going to give their children heroin so that they don't cry at night? It's ridiculous. We can all say that. However, consider the drug Ritalin. Ritalin is a Schedule II substance under the Controlled Substances Act. Schedule II drugs, which, can, which also include drugs like cocaine and methamphetamine, have a high potential for drug abuse. <clears throat> abuse of these drugs may lead to severe psychological and physical dependence. Indeed, citizens of the United States, most of them well below the drinking age or smoking age, now consume over 90% of the 8.5 tons of methylphenidate produced worldwide each year. That's Ritalin. Eight and a half tons of Ritalin are produced every year. 90% of them are taken by kids here in the United States. So what about kids in South Africa, or Argentina, or Australia? They don't have hyperactivity disorder, or they don't get diagnosed and treated. What, uh, what does it do once it's ingested? When, when kids take it, it's really interesting because the two diagnoses that, that, that they're given are like insomnia, or like it's, a, it's an inability to, to fall asleep is one, like insomnia and those types of, types of things, and attention hyperactivity is the other one. And basically what it does is it numbs the brain. It just shuts you down. So if you think about someone who's taking like meth, like a meth addict, or cocaine, it just totally changes the chemical structure inside the brain. And that's what it does. And this drug, Ritalin, is controlled exactly the same way as cocaine and, and meth. So think about what happens if you find somebody who's cooking meth next to a school. They're going to go to jail for a really, 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 really long time. But what's really funny is the same exact drug is in that school, and most of the kids are on it. 
so what's the big deal? Why don't we just all cook meth and take heroin and, and all these things? It's really preposterous. And we're laughing about these things that, that took place in the late 1800s and, and the early 1900s. I postulate 25 years from now, we're going to go, holy cow, can you believe we used to give kids this thing called fiddling? <clears throat> no wonder they're all gorked out and don't know what's going on. And you know what's pushing it is, is a lot of times, and I say this with love, my sister's a teacher, but a lot of times it's the teachers that are pushing it because it's easier to control a group of 25 children that are a little more sedate. And I don't blame the teachers. It's not their fault that these kids are, are spun out of control. Maybe it's the video games and maybe it's the sugar that they ate for breakfast and the, the, the chocolate puff cereal that they ate and the candy bar that they had at 9 a.m. And, and all the sugar surging through their system and in the nervous system that's still developing and they don't know really how to control these activities. Maybe we can make other changes that are a little more natural. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I don't know if you want to address this at another time or what. What do you do for, for kids that have been on Ritalin or that have ADHD? Mm -hmm. What is the alternative and, and how do you help them? I'm glad you asked that. We see that all the time here. And I've seen kids, dozens of kids come in that can get off of Ritalin through proper um, neurological control. In other words, we get rid of their subluxations. We have to integrate that nervous system, adjust them correctly so that their body and their brain can start to communicate effectively and process information rationally. Okay. The second thing is they need regular exercise so that they have a chance to burn off some of that sugar, some of that adrenaline, some of that stuff that's going on. When you're growing, your body's changing and you've got all this energy, you've got to burn it off somehow and a lot of kids don't get a chance to do that. And thirdly, you need to have proper nutrition. So if we're filling kids up with things that are 90% sugar, of course they're going to feel jittery. What if you all, what if you got up in the morning and ate pancakes and syrup and drank a Mountain Dew and, and you know, did all that? Would you feel a little jittery by 11 a.m.? Or would you feel a little bit out of it? Once that sugar burns off, what's that? Constipated. Yes, and that too. And, and by the time that burns off, then we're sleeping and we're out of it. And these kids do the same thing. So they come to school and they're all jittery and they're all jacked up and they're ready to go. And then they have the sugar crash and then they can't pay attention. Because first they're, they're doing this, and then pretty soon they're just not paying attention to anything because they've crashed. So it's, it's huge nutritional changes, exercise, and getting their nervous system to function correctly, and they have to get enough rest. And Most kids do not get nearly enough sleep. What, what is regular exercise for a child? How much is regular exercise and how often? And how much sleep? I think that a good baseline recommendation for children is that they should have at least 30 minutes of continuous exercise every day, but I think that's good for all of us. I went to a seminar one time where the guy said, um, he was an expert in exercise and physiology, and he said, if you go to bed at night and it's 11.30 and you realize it's 11.30 and you haven't exercised, get up. It's that important. Get out of bed. Go do your 30 minutes and then go back to bed. It's that important. And obviously he's being a little bit facetious, but what he's trying to say is get it into your day. Get it into every single day. There is no I didn't exercise today. You have to do it. It's a treat for your body and we have to do it. So, who's in charge? You are. We are. We are. We make our decisions, right? <laughs> We make our decisions. What you put in your kids, what you put in yourself, what you do for yourself. If we go across the street over to one of these beautiful new high-rise hospitals that they're putting up, do they get to decide how you treat your body, or do you get to decide? And I'm preaching to the choir because you guys are sitting here tonight. So I'm, I, I get that, and I appreciate that about you. But I want you to share this with your friends and family, okay? Don't let them do the things to you and to the people that you love that they're doing, okay? Now, if they fall down and crack their head and they're bleeding out their ears, let them do the surgery, okay? It's okay. But help them all. Yes, remember, so when you go in that hospital, they can tell you what they want to do, but you still are the person in charge. That's right. Because that's why when it happens to you. You get to decide. You don't have to take some doctor's word for it. That's right. That's There's right. There's very few decisions that happen to me right now. That's right. If it's good now, it'll be good a week from now, or it'll be good 10 days from now. Now, unless you're bleeding out your ears, obviously, right. that's different. Right. There are emergencies, but we got to take that into account. That's a good point, Marsha. Mm -hmm. So, what about an alternative? How about D.D. Palmer and Harvey Lillard? I'm going to tell you a real quick story. How many of you have ever heard of Harvey Lillard? In the back, we got it, all right. And you guys have heard of it, of course. Great. Harvey Lillard was a janitor in the Quad Cities in Davenport. And he worked in a Palmer with a guy in, in a uh, in a building with a guy named D.D. Palmer. And D.D. Palmer, for those of you who don't know, is the founder of chiropractic. Okay. And here's how chiropractic began. On this fateful day, September 18, 1895, to be exact, 
what happened is Mr. Lillard came in, he was cleaning the building, he was, he was a custodian of the building. He came in and was talking to Dr. Palmer and he said he was relating the fact that he had been deaf for some time. He couldn't hear and he had lost his hearing. He was not born deaf, but he had lost his hearing some time ago and he couldn't hear anymore. So Dr. Palmer was what they called at the time a magnetic healer. So he kind of was dabbling in different things, kind of trying to use science and use his understanding of anatomy and physiology to help people get well. And they were using all different kinds of things at the time. And so he said, you know what, let me just examine you. Let me look at you. So he lays Harvey Lillard down on a table and he starts to examine him. And he starts to look at his back and he finds this spot and where, you know, texts will, will We'll say, some say it was the lower neck, some say it was the upper back, it doesn't really matter, right? He found something that was out of place. He started to lean on it, put a little motion into it, put a little torque, and he heard this cavitation and this pop, and he let Harvey Lillard go, okay? Harvey Lillard comes back a couple days later, and he says for the first time in years, 10 years, 15 years, however long he had been deaf, he can hear the wagons on the cobblestones outside. He can start to hear, and eventually he regains his hearing. Dr. Palmer didn't do anything to that man's ears. He surmised there's nothing wrong with your ears. You didn't have an ear problem. You had a nerve conduction problem. And when he figured that out, his brain started to go a million miles an hour. If that can change, what else can change? And he started to look at the nervous system. And he started to say, if we can have full integration of the nervous system, and we can get a man to hear again, what about their stomach? What about their colon? What about their lungs and their heart? And what about their muscles? And, and what about their structure? So, chiropractic is based on the concept of innate intelligence and homeostasis. So, I said before, medicine is basing everything on this germ theory of disease. Chiropractic is basing everything on the concept of innate intelligence and homeostasis. How many of you have heard of homeostasis? It's a kind of a cool word, right? Homeostasis is a tendency towards stability in the internal environment of the organism. That means that your body is always trying to achieve stability. It doesn't like random weirdness. It doesn't like things over here and things over here. It likes it to be calm and smooth and working properly. It doesn't appreciate chaos. So another, another way to think about homeostasis is your thermostat in your house, right? If you set your thermostat at 72 degrees, does that mean the furnace always puts out exactly 72 degrees worth of air temperature into your body? No, of course not. It shuts off for a while, the temperature drops, it dips below the set point, the furnace kicks in, it brings the temperature up above 72 for a little bit, it shuts back off. It turns back on when that temperature dips back down. So it's this constant up and down, negative feedback, turning that thing on and off. The same thing happens in your body. Everything is controlled by homeostasis and negative feedback. So your, your body's constantly in communication, letting you know, I need more oxygen, I need less carbon dioxide, or I need more carbon dioxide. I need more food, now I'm tired, I need rest. I need these things to help hold me from getting into chaos. So, if we remember back to the nervous system, chiropractic was founded in 1895 and has made significant strides in advancing healthcare over the past century. Chiropractors look at the function of the nervous system, which is the master controller of our body. We specialize in the detection and correction of misalignments in the spine in order to remove stress from the nervous system. Taking stress off the nerves allows the body to function and heal optimally. Okay? It's that simple. It's just that easy. If you think about it, and you've got a communication system that makes my finger do this, what has to happen? In order for my finger to do this, I need neurons to come running down my arm to send a signal to tell the muscles on this side of my finger to pull the finger down. But then when it's done, I need them to relax, and I need the muscles on the back side to pull it back up. And it's this constant communication that has to happen. Keep in mind, while I'm doing this, I'm still blinking, I'm still breathing, I'm still secreting enzymes, my body's still fighting cancer. There's a hundred trillion cells going on communicating all at the same time. Which one of those communication pathways do you want to not work tomorrow? That's what subluxation is all about. If you've got a spot that's not working, you better get it fixed because it's going to cause problems in your body. Now tomorrow that problem might be that I can't straighten out my finger. Okay, we can fix that. If we get that pressure off that nerve and allow those muscles to strengthen and allow that process to work again, that finger will come back up. But what if it's something going on in my liver or my organs or my, my lungs? And I don't know it because I can't feel it. Am I like that guy who's puking? Or am I like that girl who's got breast cancer developing inside? We don't know. We don't know what's going on inside of us. So the, what, the, I guess the scope of what I'm trying to get at is we can't be reactive anymore. Medicine has taught us to be reactive. Stay home, you're fine. If it hurts, come back and see me. Take two of these and call me in the morning. Let me know if you feel better. Great, you feel better, but you're going to die in a year because your pain went away. Your pain is a signal to you that is something is wrong. But oftentimes that problem developed long before that pain began. 
the only way to truly be preventive in our health care is to eat right, exercise right, get enough sleep. Dr. Vince always, always is harping on think well, move well, live well, all these things, right? Breathe well. We have to be well, and you have to be proactive. Exercise, eat well, put good things in your body, remove things that are bad, and primarily adjust the system that integrates it and puts it all together. If you don't, you're not going to be truly well. You're going to get by for a while, but are you as well as you could be? Let's say somebody, and people will say, well, my grandmother lived to be 96, never got adjusted in a day in her life. That may be true. What was the quality of her life? Did she have problems along the way? Could she have been 98 instead of 96? Did she become senile and have Parkinson's at the end of her life? Did she need to have those things? Those are all possibilities. So it's about quality of life. It's not about how long we live, it's how well we live during that time. 33 principles. The page I gave you, you can look it over. Um, I just think it's really cool and that's why I always hand it out. Um, part of what I did as a chiropractor is I went back after chiropractic school and I got what's called the Legion of Chiropractic Philosophers and there's 150 of us in the world that have done this program and it's a philosophy program and I've got a little shiny metal in the office and stuff up. I'll impress you sometime with it. but. What we based all of this postdoctorate thesis talk on was these 33 principles. If you want to know what governs chiropractic and what governs our decisions, read these principles. And when you read them, they're going to sound really weird. You know why? They were written back in the early 1900s. Okay? So they're old. They're back a long time. Have things really changed? Not for us. Because these principles were put into a book in 1925, and they were taken from books that were written in the late 1800s and put together. And I'll tell you this, every time you come into my office and you sit down in my chair and I adjust C7 from the right, I'm adjusting C7 from the right, not just because it's fixated, not just because my scope says it. Those are very important things, and that's part of our Gonstead system. But I'm adjusting you C7 from the right because these 33 principles say it's okay to do that. And if one of these things doesn't fit, if it doesn't match, if it's not right, it changes the way we think about your body. This governs everything. It talks about things like universal intelligence, innate intelligence, how the world is governed, how our bodies are governed, and how we heal and self-regulate. It's important stuff, and it's kind of deep philosophical stuff, but I think it's really fun to read through because there's some really cool things. There's a principle in there called the principle of time. Everything takes time. Healing takes time. If I'm going to walk from here to there, it takes time. I can't instantly go from here to where Dr. Thad is. It takes time. It might not take very much time, but it takes time. And I try to remind people of that when they come into the office once in a while, too, because we all have this right now idea of what healthcare is. Because if you go over there, they're going to say, take this pill. You're going to get better right away. You're not going to get better right away. Your symptoms might go go away right away. But when you come in here, we're going to correct years and years and years and years and years of old problems and damage. And not only that, but guess what? You're going to walk out here today and you're going to damage it again. And we're going to have to fix that on top of the years and years and years of damage. So it takes time. And it's not just to try to get you to come back more often. If we wanted to do that, we could come up with a whole array of lies and garbage to get you to do that. They're building high rises across the street that are based on those things. We're going to do this because it takes time to correct the body to get it back to its natural state to make it work and function at its optimum potential. That's what it's all about. These 33 principles guide us and, and correct us in that. Dr. Clarence Gonstead, this is a guy that makes me smile and Dr. Thad's smiling already too. We love this guy. If you come into this office, we're going to tell you about Gonstead. We're going to say the word Gonstead. We're going to talk about Gonstead. Gonstead was a man and he was from Wisconsin. He was a chiropractor and he lived from 1898 to 1978. And here's what I pulled up about him. Dr. Gonstead gave our profession, chiropractic, a logical and biomechanically sound system for practicing chiropractic. With a gift for solving mechanical problems, he developed his own ideas on subluxation, x-ray, adjusting bones, through the empirical data that he gathered from his large practice. You think Dr. Vince sees a lot of patients? You should have seen the Gonstead Clinic. They flew people in from out of the country to come and see this guy. This guy was the man. And you know why? Because he developed the system. Instead of thinking about things in an abstract way, he took all of that information and then he made this biomechanical routine method for looking for subluxation in your spine. We adhere to that system directly here. Now, why don't you get that when you go to all the chiropractors in, the, in, in town? This is hard to learn. It takes a lot of time. You have to really dedicate yourself to learning this process. We run a thing called a scope. We take full spine x-rays. We're strict. We adjust you based on vectors and directions, and we put your spine in specific positions, and it's extremely difficult to learn. 
When I was a student in chiropractic school, one of the hardest things to learn is to adjust the spine, the neck, in an upright seated position. You can lay people down and you can turn their head from side to side and you can cause things to crack up and down, all the way up and down the spine. And I'm not saying that other chiropractors are way outside. They're still correcting subluxations and it's still good. But our style is biomechanically sound. And when you sit somebody up in a chair and you adjust that neck, it's the most specific, safe, functional way to take a subluxation out of the cervical spine. Dr. Gonstead did that, and we thank him for doing that. That was a cool thing. At Hassel Family Chiropractic, we adhere to the principles of, of chiropractic and the technique espoused by Dr. Clarence Gonstead. So these 33 principles drive our philosophy. That's the why. Why do we do this? And, and why? Why does chiropractic happen? Why do we make our decisions? Dr. Gonstead taught us how to do it correctly. So all of this foundational stuff comes in, and then he said, okay, now we're going to adjust from the right side at C7, but this is how you position your body. And biomechanically, this is how you think about this plane. This is how you think about this line of correction. So when we're making these adjustments, this is what comes into play. While each, while each of our doctors here at Hassel Family Chiropractic continuously learns and expands our understanding of how the body functions, it serves to only more solidify our belief that the body is indeed a self-healing, self-maintaining organism. So when I say chiropractic hasn't changed over the last 115 years, don't think of that as a bad thing. They haven't exactly rewritten the Bible lately either, have they? Right? They, they feel like they got it right the first time and they're going to stick to it. And you know what? We think we've got it right too and we're going to stick to it. The human body and the human form hasn't changed in 115 years and neither has our technique because it's right. It was right the first time. They came across it. They figured it out. They put it together. We continuously learn why it works. There's stuff in green books. Green books are books that were written by these palmers back in the late 1800s in Davenport, Iowa. There's stuff in there that they still haven't been able to prove, but they're working on it. So now that we have these digital scanners and PET scans and EMGs and all these things, we can finally understand what those guys knew 100 years ago. They were the Albert Einsteins of chiropractic. That's really what happened. Does everybody understand Einstein? No, but we know that the theory of relativity, relativity is probably correct. We don't necessarily understand Isaac Newton, but we know when an apple falls on your head, gravity did that. And we understand the relationship of mass and how gravity works, because he figured it out. The Palmers figured it out, and we stick to it, and that's the way it works here. So, true healing comes from above down, inside out, it always has and it always will. The truth is the truth. The laws of chiropractic are unswerving and steadfast. I want to read one more thing, and then I'm going to shut up or give you guys a chance for questions, okay? Listen to the listen to the way these guys talked, okay? This is Dr. B.J. Palmer. Dr. D.D. Palmer started chiropractic. This is his son. And his son is a really cool guy. This B.J. Palmer was really flamboyant. And he was out there, and he was just this wild guy because they had money, and they had brains, and they could do whatever they wanted. But listen to the way that these people talked back then. I think it's really cool. Dr. B.J. Palmer said this about chiropractic. And pay attention. When I read this, Think about what medicine says and how they're going to fix you if you're broken and you're going to take this pill and you're going to do this and you're going to do this and it's all science and it's all these things. But listen to the language of what Dr. B.J. Palmer said. I, I love this. It gives me chills. We chiropractors work with the subtle substance of the soul. We release the prisoned impulses, a tiny rivulet of force that emanates from the mind and flows over the nerves to the cells and stirs them to life. We deal with the magic power that transforms common food into living, loving, thinking clay. That robes the earth with beauty and hues, and scents the flowers with the glory of the air. In the dim, dark, distant long ago, when the sun first bowed to the morning star, this power spoke and there was life. It quickened the slime of the sea and the dust of the earth, and drove the cell to union with, with its fellows in countless living forms. Through eons of time it finned the fish and winged the bird and fanged the beast. Endlessly it worked evolving its form until it produced the crowning glory of them all. With tireless energy, it blows the bubble of each individual life and then silently, relentlessly, dissolves the form and absorbs the spirit into itself again. And yet you ask, can chiropractic cure appendicitis or the flu? Have you more faith in a knife or a spoonful of medicine than in the power that animates the living world? Mm -hmm. Pretty eloquent. Mm -hmm. Pretty eloquent. The guy knew what he was talking about. He was amazing. He sat down and he thought about this stuff. Mm -hmm. We think about this stuff and we want you to think about this stuff. That's what it comes down to for me. Can chiropractic cure appendicitis or the flu? If you were here last week, Dr. Vince says no. Chiropractic doesn't cure anything, right? But your body can cure anything. 
you all have cancer right now, but are you getting sick? Nope, not as long as you stay here and get well. Eat good food, get good rest tonight, get your exercise, get adjusted. Your body can do all these things. We're not claiming to cure anything. We'll never, we're, we will never cure anything, never. Anybody who tells you different is lying. But if your body's functioning at its best, you have the best chance of survival. And not only just survival, you have the best chance to thrive. That's what it's about for us. We do it for ourselves. My little seven-week-old baby gets adjusted. Four minutes old, she got her first check. As soon as they got her dried off and set her on the bed, I checked her. Because I don't want her to be ten minutes with a subluxation. I want her to express herself to her fullest potential every single day. Now, do I have to adjust her every day? No. But I'm checking her all the time. Every time I hold her, I'm wiggling her, and I'm checking her out. I want her to be perfect. I want her to be the best that she can possibly be. Whatever perfect is for her, I know she'll have shortcomings, and I know she'll have failures, and I know she'll have problems. But I want her to be the best. I want her to exceed her potential. I want her to be at the end of her envelope. And I want that for each of you. When you guys come here, I want you to understand that you're part of our family. You're part of the Hassel Family Chiropractic family. And you're just as important to us as our own family. When you come in here, you will get taken care of. And if they say we're busy, we'll fire the person at the front desk. <laughs> if you guys come, we want to take care of you. It takes time. It takes dedication. You have to stay with it. But that's what we're here for, and that's what we do. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Otherwise, uh, thanks for coming. I appreciate it.